All right, everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind Show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We have a very special guest on today. We're very excited. We just had a quick conversation before this, but we uh, learned that he's really an underachiever. Yeah, he, he doesn't and have enough going on. They he, really should he needs do a, to add a few more things to it. They really should do a lot more. So, <laughs> um, so this gentleman we know from the mastermind group that we're in, and uh, obviously they are, they are, you'll find out, they're one of the top uh players in the country on a few different aspects of real estate investing so uh we have nathan trunfio say right you got it man you got all it all right there we go i said it right <laughs> very good so nathan yeah. trunfio he's from uh from dlp and uh i'll let nathan kind of take over for a minute and tell us about you and where you're from and what you do and you guys have a lot going on so prepare yeah. yourself listeners here we go yeah so thank you so much i i honestly i'm such an underachiever i just came to listen and learn from you guys so i don't <laughs> no, have I much to show you i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> but but nonetheless um very blessed to be here honored to be here uh and big fans of yours and, and looking forward to collaborating just because uh you know we run a vertically integrated business such as i know you you do and when you do that there's a lot of fun a lot of action and a lot of work to get done uh to yeah. say the very least um a lot of so <laughs> and then some and then some so um yeah never never enough time in the day to get things done but um so our parent company is called dlp real estate capital um it's formed by our awesome founder and ceo of all the companies still to this day don wenner young guy like myself uh we started off and he started off as a realtor we've grown that realty brokerage still very active today in little lehigh valley pennsylvania uh, we grew to number eight in the nation in uh, Wall Street Journal's list of two. Th we did 2,100 units last year, transactions. From there, we started get it, becoming a, an operator ourselves, and we started growing our organization. And we, Don, literally started as a single person, you know, brokerage. Now we have 30 agents, give or take, um, and then started just getting into investing ourselves. This was about 12 years ago. So we went down the road of doing a lot of fix and flips. That allowed us to build out a construction team. We got pretty good at executing on that, certainly under some tailwind of the markets as well. Uh, we flipped, you know, call it 1,200 plus homes over that time. And during that, Don started raising a lot of money, um, it, you know, through private investor notes and realized that that was pretty tedious. So that allowed us to then open up funds. And that's where we, we really poured gasoline onto the fire because we, as, as many do when raising capital, we, we started to get in bigger checks because we showed good execution. We continue to pay good returns. Um, and so we have opened up funds now to continue to grow in our investing, which is transitioned from single family to multifamily. Um, we, we now acquire all 200 plus unit uh, communities. We own about 10,000 doors. We self-manage about 90% uh, of those doors now. So we have a large property management team, um, all sourced by or, or fueled by the capital that we raise in our funds. And then the long story short is I run our lending business called DLP Direct Lending Partners. We lend on all things fix and flip, single family new construction, multifamily bridge. We've been lending through all this pandemic and COVID stuff, mainly because we're self-sufficient in how we're capitalized. We raise the money in our fund, deploy the money uh, with full discretion. We're not relying on Wall Street, but where we came about was because Don got tired of taking hard money loans from other lenders and said, let's open up a lending institution and started sort of a side, you know, side investment piece and then has really grown to an awesome organization. I'm lucky to uh, be deemed sort of day-to-day -day leader of 30 awesome teammates. Um, and so we're a big, happy family of companies, 350 people strong among all the units, collaborate together. I'm, I'm very honored to be on our executive team, helping lead the initiatives and strategy moving forward. As we continue to grow, we, we will surpass a billion dollars in asset man assets under management this year and the lending and, and equity arms of our business. Um, and so that's the little bit that we underachieve on as we continue to work to achieve more and more. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed. I really wish you'd find more stuff to do in your day. I really, it's just not quite enough. I just, it's really one of those things. I just, you know, really, just, you should be ashamed of yourself, really. I don't think you're doing quite enough out there. So, wow, that's a ton of stuff you have going on, a ton of information. And that takes a team. That's not one person handling it. Right. It's very important for people to understand that that takes a team to have that kind of a business. How, how big do you think your team is employee-wise all around with all that business you just talked yes. about? Yeah, so great question. So it's it's 350 people. Um, yes. About we call it 200 people right now. Well, we just took over more staff. So probably 225 people at least are in property management. And then the rest we sort of call our like corporate companies more so. And so that's the remainder of 125, 150 people. Um, yeah. Like I said, lending companies, about 30 people. What's interesting is that 
like we've added significant amount of you know people as you if you will um, in order to grow to this point but on a moving forward basis we're actually looking to continue to grow and we've grown profitably from a you know, call it revenue and profitability standpoint we're actually not really looking to grow in regards to a people standpoint at this point I think we we will add people incrementally but not at the same rate as we have to get to where we are we've done a really a good job and, and spent a lot of time bringing in true leaders that can help organize processes and our people to continue to move forward, you know, with with the same strategies and mentality. And now it's just about the uh, accountability and execution of everybody at the same level we're at to get us to the next level in production. Really start fine tuning your processes and and that yeah, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean it's I'll crazy. Work. We've grown we've grown fast, and as fast growing companies know, it's like you look at we're still doing it that way like really right. but it's just because of you know the accelerated growth so that's what we're refining and by refining process and technologies um look we love to add more great people but at the same time you, you don't want to be too saturated and that diminishes then accountability and, and all that yeah you want to be as efficient as possible you know exactly. i want to i want to tackle your journey from kind of where you started to how you got here but because i think people would like to i think our listeners would love to hear that yeah. story but first i want to know you've mentioned several times the important you've mentioned great people great team members great leader how important do you think i you know having the right people in the right seats in your business if you're going to grow your business how important is that man so we are all about rprs right people right seat we're oh, speaking oh, i didn't know there was an acronym for it that's good all right yeah so i think, I think it's, uh jim collins i believe um good to great oh good to great uh, I, believe, yeah. I believe and keep the right people on the bus but that's actually exactly how we look at um sort of if somebody's a fit is what is their right seat or you know in what their skill sets their experience does that fit what we need from them and more importantly to your point of culture is are they the right person so we have a very 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 well defined um culture if you will and a lot of people will say that, but I'll try and give a couple brief examples as to exemplify it is, so we have now 10 core values that is up throughout all of our offices. Um, and those principles are talked about in many of our sort of big team type meetings. Um, you know, it, it, so we then focus on all of those principles when we look at bringing somebody into the team, do they exemplify it? And we're pretty strict at that. We have a very detailed screening process. Um, and then those core values such as grit, delivering wow customer service, um, leadership, um, um, humble servants, stuff like that. Um, that's just, it's something that breathes throughout the organization. And it's as much and important to our leaders um, embodying that culture and those core values, but also everybody within and the accountability of it. And so that's where we look at it is, are you a right person? And, and then hopefully then we put you in the right seat and you put yourself in the right seat um to keep the the wheels in the bus and keep that bus moving forward down the road that of, of growth and of scale um but to your point it is uh, of uber importance i mean we mission statement finding your purpose your passion and making sure that it is very visible to everybody and it really it starts at the top but it certainly doesn't end there take us on the journey i we agree with you 100 percent. that's very yeah. true i mean it's and you know i i think probably in the last decade or so that's even gotten more important or at least more you know more awareness has been brought to it before it was just kind of about i'm gonna you know go get a job and do it for an hourly wage and i don't really care what i do and just you know bring home the paycheck but i think now people are looking for more fulfillment in their work and enjoyment and when you find people that their core values align with your core values as a company, it does create just a better environment and a better workforce. I think it's probably, it's the only way you can actually scale and grow. Would you agree? Uh, I completely Definitely. agree. And you add in a culture of like goal setting and accountability to like KPIs within that. And, but, but I mean the culture itself. And what's funny is like a lot of people, especially like small businesses that look at a big company and they say, oh, culture this and culture that. They think it's all a bunch of fluff, but like I you're know. absolutely right, Glenn. It it is like the most important thing. It's the glue that holds us together because otherwise we continue to burst at the seams and and not be uh, successful in scaling and more specifically scaling profitably. So I, you know, a lot of people that we talk to that have run big businesses and that are doing multifamilies or storage units or they're lending or whatever, they all seem to start with a house. You know, it seems like everything starts with and, and us too. But everybody everything starts with a house. And I'm kind of curious. That journey kind of, you know, I don't know if you know yeah. how it all started back when the founder found it and all that stuff, but I'd be really curious to know kind of that journey of, you know, how it started from single family. And then 
you guys moved into, which always seems to be the next, the next progression is going into multifamily, yeah. right? So then that seems to be where you're, where you really have a big, a big presence right now. So I'm just share a little bit of that journey a little bit, kind of how that yes yeah, so, now saying, how big can I get? And it's like, you know, big as you want to get, just depends what you want to take on. It's, it's <clears> true. <throat> it's true. And so I'll, I'll, Don, I can't take Don's story, but the, the, the story of us growing as an operator, literally, like you said, started with a house. And the short story of it was that Don was um, helping an elderly lady sell her home and the buyer walked at closing and he had made some good money uh, through growing uh, his own realty brokerage. And he just went to the bank, got the money, bought the house cash, renovated it, flipped it. He's now actually flipped that home. I forget if it's either two or three times the same exact home. Um, and so <laughs> with, with that, that sort of got the wheels spinning of like, wow, there's there's true solutions that are needed out there for cash buyers, as is all the direct to seller solutions. Um, and, and so he also, he's a great marketing mind too. He saw that he could grow his realty brokerage by providing that other solution, but then realized, oh crap, if, if I need to deliver the solution of buying cash and then renovating and repositioning assets, I got to have a construction team and team to analyze it and scope it out and all that stuff. So that's really where we got started. And then by growing and going back to the people and the culture and the team is like, he just kept adding people that were subject matter experts to uh, construction, uh, the project management, acquisitions, transaction coordinators, just like many operators do. And, and then we kept growing from there. So um, the important thing of all of it is is doing it profitably, right? Because if you can't create the profits, returns, cash flow, then you don't have any additional gasoline to then continue to throw into that engine to keep it turning and burning. Uh, and then at the same time, if you want to go and raise money, which was the route that we started that allowed us, again, that same sort of gasoline to continue to grow as capital, uh, in order to raise that money, you have to be able to deliver returns. So Warren Buffett says it himself, but like we believe in and in, in embody a culture of like zero losses. Like we will always and have always paid out no matter what. Um, and sure, there are a couple of deals along the way. I know Don didn't make money on it, especially early on. We all do. I mean, especially for the nature of fix and flip, you don't know what's behind the walls till you literally rip them open. Right. Right. Um, and so, but but by learning all that and muscling through it and having some home runs and some singles and some maybe strikeouts per se as well, um, it, and finding people and process and scaling that way is where we kept going, growing and going. And Don's all about like making sure we grow profitably and that we're always forward thinking and how can we do something and scale? And that's where the question and the answer came to multifamily of like, how can we fix and flip more like 10, 10 times the amount that you do and invest in one property? And that was, oh, well, let's just look at properties that have 10 units. And so that's where we started our progression was we didn't, we're now, as I said earlier in the intro, our buy box is 200 plus units, but we started at the 10 to 12 units that, that we just got great opportunities to buy at a discount. Then we removed up to the 20, 25, then it was 50, then 75. Then for quite a while, it was, we won't look at anything under a hundred units. Um, but it took all of the additional subject matter experts, processes to be put in place, discipline to an investment strategy and to due diligence to make sure that we can follow suit in the investment strategy, then circling back to driving home deals that provide a profit and good returns with no losses to keep incentivizing people to invest capital with us. And so I know I'm sort of conceptual and high level there, but the, the main takeaway I hope from listeners is like, we didn't start at the end. We started at the beginning while looking at the end and figuring out how to get there. And most of the time it ended up being certainly need the capital to do it, but you got to bring the right people into the right seats, build the right process with the right culture to hold everybody accountable to the goals that we set as leaders moving forward. So a lot of our listeners are people that are either wanting to get into investing and they're wanting to learn or they're brand new investors that only have a little bit of experience. Yeah. So take them take take someone through like, you know, how to go about you, you said you do a lot of credit and all, all of that kind of stuff. Take somebody through that journey of of how to get started and getting the lender and going from one house to three houses and then, you yeah. know, maybe transition from going from single family to multifamily. Take us through that process from somebody that doesn't know much. From a credit standpoint? Or where? I'll, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak somewhat because look, I think we could spend between the three of us probably an hour or two going through right. half of that. Days. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'll, I will, um, I'll, I'll try and touch some, some key principles. Um, the first being very high level, 
Um, but uh, I'm a big believer in you know facts, articles, whatever tell um, that successful. The one thing that's very different from successful people or people that have scaled to people that haven't quite yet is simply one word of action. Mm -hmm. So sure, there's a lot of things I'll talk about in regards to do due diligence, knowing what you're doing, having a business plan, and all that. But at some point, you got to just like jump into the pool somewhere. Now you don't want to jump into the deep end, but you got to take that first step into the pool. Maybe it's just the kiddie pool. It doesn't really matter where, but you got to take action. That's the one thing. If you've been thinking about it, you've you've been you you've been a um, a student of a teacher for a while. You got to do that first deal, or you got to attempt to do two deals at the same time and take that action. But you have to do it with a plan. So we all know the original concept. I have to start to with taking action is you have to be able to buy right, right? I mean, you don't make your money in a fix and flip deal by renovating it. You make your money by buying the right asset. You know, you can yeah. talk about location. Tell the same thing. <laughs> it, yeah. Exactly. And so that's why a lot of people look to go like the direct to seller route or other creative marketing mechanisms. But it doesn't matter how you find the deal because there's a lot of ways to do that. But you have to make sure you find a good deal. And what is a good deal is essentially something that you can buy at a discount. There's a lot of methods that I could talk to, especially from a credit lending perspective on how to analyze that. But Bottom line is you have to be able to find a way to get a property less than what market is. You have to have a solution for that seller in order to be able to acquire it at that. And then more importantly, and where I really, where we, from a lending perspective, see a lot of people go wrong is they don't have a full actual business plan. So what I mean by that is, sure, I mean, like you have to know how you're going to buy the property. So you have to figure out what lenders to go to and what type of terms they'll give you and if you can make profit with that type of you know financial route or not um but so there's vetting a lender and making sure you're qualified for it but you have to have your property business plan too right i mean you especially if you're new you have to make sure you walk properties thoroughly maybe you're walking them with contractors if you're not you know a, a specialist in that area you have to plan for the worst you have to make sure your scope of works include everything that you might have to fix and not cut corners and say, eh, I think the 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 gas burner is going to be okay for at least the flip. All of a sudden it goes, it's a four thousand dollar expense to replace the whole system and everything else. And now you just lost, you know, a quarter of your profit or what have you. You right. have to have a diligent business plan. You have to think through um, all of the logistics of repositioning a house if you're fixing and flipping. And then you have to be realistic with all of the capital it re will require to acquire the property, to hold the property, reposition it. And what people often forget to do is take out the exit disposition costs. Um, yeah. So I know I'm getting into some specifics, but talking high level. But as you can hear, like the biggest thing is have a business plan. Because where we see people go wrong is like, look, we as humans make decisions off of emotion. But you can't make emotional decisions in real estate. It has to be strategy-based business plan based decisions. So you have to know what to look for, whether you you know, are a self-made student with YouTube master or Google master, or you, you go to a specific real estate coach. Uh, you have to sort of know what you're doing first to be disciplined, diligent, but identify a plan, then execute on it. If you want to then do two properties, you have to do that twice. It's a lot more work. You know, you can't, just because you made money on one deal doesn't mean you're going to be able to handle two. You have to have that much diligence to both business plans, to both acquisitions, um, and, and so on and so forth. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah. It's probably not much that's new to many people, but it is like we see it. I mean, as you said, I, I, I help manage and run credit. And so that means I see 80 to 150 deals come in the pipeline and there's X amount of fallout and we close, you know, call it 50 to 60 percent of that. So I see a lot of deals and the ones that fail, the ones that die and kill themselves because the appraisal came in low are the ones that you could tell there was no real plan. They didn't real use real diligence to identify if this was a profitable and achievable deal or not. You gotta have a plan. I love what you said too. You have to have action and you have to execute. You mentioned that several times while we were while you were talking and that's that's the key. You get the best plan in the world doesn't mean a damn thing if you don't execute. If you don't, take action. If you don't make, take action, you can say, I got the best plan in the world. That's great. Where is it? It's in my closet. That's awesome. And you know what I love about <laughs> this too is, you know, he, he just, Nathan, you're focused more on lending. Now, Glenn and I do mostly the fix and flips and, and rental portfolios and stuff like that. But a lot of the verbiage <clears throat> that you're actually saying is so similar to what we've even said in our in our previous sure. podcast. So I love that we're speaking the same language, even though it's kind of a little bit yeah. different areas of it so that people get to hear it in a different way. So I, I want to think about, 
Oh, go ahead. I was go ahead. Say one last thing, because I think that like there is the you have a plan, you take action, you execute on it. But the important thing about the execution is that you stick to the plan and stay disciplined. Ah, so like, I do a point. handful of deals on, on it myself, right? My my I, I partner with somebody and I and we say our box is we're never going to get into a project with more than thirty five thousand dollars worth of renovation. I have a full time job that takes all of my focus. I do it on the side. I can't manage too much and too big of a construction project. Well, what do you know? The one deal in the last two years that's given me the most headache is a ninety thousand dollar renovation oh, yeah, for a gut job. Do. So it's like I didn't <laughs> stick to my plan. No crap that that I'm you know I'm not going to lose money on it. Thank goodness, but I'm not going to make the money that was in my pro forma in my diligent business plan because I went outside of my original box. Why? Well, why is it those ones those 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 ninety and hundred thousand okay. renovations? They never make the money you no. think. Not even close. They're it's they're crazy. always a nightmare. <laughs> and the, the the other trap I see people falling into is doing things that they think are moving them forward, but they're really just busy work. For example, you know, trying to do all of the work themselves versus hiring it out. Whereas if you hire it out, it can be done in you know four yeah. or six weeks. Versus trying to do it all yourself because you feel busy, you feel like you're accomplishing something, but all that money they spent in holding costs and everything just like blew their deal. Yeah, it's like taking action on the right things is right. so important. So I wanna talk about lending because that's where you spend a lot of your time. And I think that yep. a lot of people, especially in today's climate, but I have a question for you beforehand that has nothing to do with that. So we're always looking for great, not we, but people in our industry are always looking for great people. And you talked about that. So I'm curious, how did you and Don meet? So Don is the visionary, I guess the owner and you're kind of the integrator, right? You run a lot of that stuff. How'd you yeah, like how do you find I, so, you? So one real quick, I got to share my one analogy is that it, you know visionary and, and executor integrator. I call it the kite and the string. There's the kite, Ooh, and then there's the string like that, that ties it to the ground. So, I like so that's that. my analogy. Um, so the the long story short is um, I was running a debt fund in the B two B space, and um, I'll just put it as something happened where I, we part mutually parted ways, and I was out looking for a job like 90% through my personal network. And so it's not that great of a story because I didn't find Don through my personal network. I literally sent out one resume on ZipRecruiter to be the sales manager of DLP Real, um, Direct Lending Partners. And that was the only resume I sent out, the only interview I took that wasn't a like a referral based one. And it was just happenstance. So I came in, um, I have a, a whole, my whole career has been in lending and real estate and helping grow and scale organizations. I came in to run sales Within three months, I was promoted to president, which I, I'm I am proud of. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna apologize for saying that. It's an honor as well uh, to be given that opportunity from Don and DLP. Um, and you know the the rest is sort of history from there. But um, literally was sort of just the one resume happenstance, and the stars aligned. And Don and I speak very much the same language. And um, and I've been very fortunate to be given a lot of the keys to driving this car. And it's, like you said earlier, it's it's not me, it's our team. Um, sure. But Certainly, it, it's taken a, a lot of work. We've come a long way. We were about 15 people when I started. We're 30 now, and you know, at the end of the month, we'll be 35. So we're growing pretty fast. Oh, that's awesome. I want to uh, jump into the lending, but before we do that, tell people how they can find you. Just mid, We're going to do it again at the end, but make sure they tell me how they can find you and connect with you. Yes. So from a lending perspective, directlendingpartners.com. You can email at info at directlendingpartners.com. And then um, I too, and I'm very, very excited because I have yet to have uh, on my podcast two people. So I can't wait to have both of you on. Um, but it's called Talking Loudly, uh, talkingloudly.com. You can check out my podcast. Very new and hopeful to get up to the, 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 the place where you guys are at here. And again, that's why I'm very fortunate. So talkingloudly.com for the podcast, directlendingpartners.com if you need some money on a good real estate investment deal. So lead right into that. Let's talk about lending. So this is a big thing in the market nowadays is lending. And, you know, I, we hear credit markets are shrinking because of COVID and all the nonsense going on. So, you know, I would love to hear your perspective yeah. on money. That's probably the most thing I want to hear. I think people want to hear about that now. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, as we all know, I mean, we're we're here in early mid, mid June. Um, there's been a lot changed in the lending world since, you know, th literally three months ago when COVID hit. Um, and as you said, um, what you call the capital markets sort of froze and shrunk. And the capital markets from just definition sake is that's where lenders go to find their money. Because what most people don't realize is that most lenders, whether you're residential, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, or you're a private lender in the hard money space like we are, they go to a money source like an institutional bank through the capital markets to get their money. And so most lenders are supported by Wall Street, we'll just put it that way. And Wall Street froze 
their lenders. And so that's why you saw a lot of lenders come off the shelves. Now here in, in June specifically, a lot of them are coming back. Um, but it just shows that most lenders are reliant upon sort of Wall Street to get their money. Um, and the, the, they, they not only had to sort of pause or we all sort of, well, we didn't pause, but most had to pause mainly because of their capital reasons, and their capital structuring. But just as importantly, just like investors trying to figure out what the hell you do with the deal nowadays, like how do you pencil it out? Are yeah, ARVs right. going to be 10% cut, 5% cut, 20% cut? Disposition Holy time going to be twice as long? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to fit we were trying to figure that out. And then in, in any time with lending where there's a more perceived risk, you know, us lenders, we always like tighten up. Right. And so that's what's happened a little bit. You're seeing like the requirement for credit scores go up, mainly because credit scores depict somebody's repayment predictability from a lending perspective. We see that we've uh, a lot of lenders have increased their requirements from the amount of experience that they will require. Um, because there's less risk when there's experience, which shows proof of execution. Um, and so across the board in the private lending, real estate investing space, you've seen most people reduce their leverage around about 10%, 5 to 10%, I'll say. We ourselves reduced 5%, but we've been funding through all of this because we're self-sufficient and how we're capitalized. Um, but, you know, you're just seeing that tightening. We, we, we as a lending community, um, there was so much demand for lending and then so much originations and production as a result of that, that like it was the race to the bottom. And what I mean by that is like the race to the best terms. You saw rates, you know, you look back 10 years ago, you're easy double digits no matter where you look and four points. We were down to as crazy of like seven to eight percent and one point wow. for a lot of lenders. Wow. We weren't necessarily there, but on the West Coast specifically, they were. And now we sort of normalized in the in between. You know, most lending now is um, 10 percent and two points. Uh, most for the most part for now and the leverage used to be either 90 percent of purchase and reno or 90 percent of purchase and 100 percent of renovation now most lenders are 80 percent of purchase and 100 percent of renovation we structure it at 85 percent of cost so we were 90 now we're 85 hence the five percent reduction but that's sort of some high level and then detail level on what's going on in the real estate investing world mainly a lot of it tied to the capital markets uncertainty of the future there the Wall Street pulling a lot of money off the, you know, out because they wanted to invest. Everybody in times of recession and distress goes upscale and upstream, I should say. And the private lending world was not as accepted from Wall Street, I, I will put it that. So that's why you saw the money flood away. And then the whole part about figuring out how to analyze what the credit risks were because of just the change in the markets and the perceived change uh, as well. Nathan, do you guys uh, lend nationally? Yeah, great. I love, love that question. So we're in about 30 something states. So pretty much if you go the western part of Texas, all the way up north and everything east of that, uh, for the most part. So um, we're, we're eastern half of the U.S. lender for the most part. Is, okay. New York, is New York one of them? I hate to say this, but we've, we have sh put New York um, <clears throat> on pause right now. Actually, as much oh, for okay. we're working on licensing, um, uh, some additional licensing there. Um, and certainly New York got hit pretty hard. Um, it's a tough environment to lend in in New York for a couple of reasons, um, legislation-wise as well oh, as we know. foreclosure. Yeah, you, we yeah know. you're going. Great place to do business. New York, New York yeah. I mean, not, I mean, they, it's horrible to do business here, but the good news is we have <laughs> sub-zero win winters. Right. So that's awesome. It's got a lot Great. of upside. Oh, it's got a lot of upside here. Oh, well, yeah. I have, a, I have a, one of my best sales reps is up in, uh, I think, Plattsburgh, I believe it is. Oh, um, my goodness. That's so he's up north of us. I was yeah. going to say, I think he's north of you. So we, yeah. we're representing up northern New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that's pretty great. So you, you, you guys have a really good view of the entire – market really i mean you did residential you you do commercial now you do lending you see so much i'm really curious what you see happening what do you i know that your crystal ball is broken so is mine people always ask me what's going to happen I'm like i don't really know i have my thoughts but i'm curious what your thoughts are we're not going to hold you to it but i'm curious what your thoughts are what's going to happen with the market now it to me feels a little different than the housing crunch of 2008 were you guys in the in business back then by the way we were just start. Uh, the realty brokerage was just starting then. The lending we've been about five years, so okay. we sort of made it through it, but really came out the middle to back half of it. So I gotta, I gotta make sure we're clear. So we started at the same time. We started 2008. And we've got, uh, we've done about 600 flips and about 40 some rentals. You guys have 10,000. I think we must suck. 
You know what I mean? We must just be slackers. You know what I mean? So I need to let go of the string a little bit. Let I that know, tight my, fly. my God, I know. What when the hell? You were doing in New York, though. Out. It's just harder in New York. That's the reason, right? I, honestly, yeah. So, so it's so funny as we as we are meeting more and more friends and and networking, and we're people like God. Why do you do? It's hard to do, and I'm like, it is. I mean, it's definitely hard. It's hard to make rent work. It's you know, taxes are crazy here. Literally, you know, taxes on a on a hundred thousand dollars. We're we're gonna be buying a house here uh, this week just to flip, and it's a. Uh, I think we're gonna pay we're gonna pay whatever forty three for it and put thirty into it. Maybe sell it for one twenty. Taxes are probably four grand on that house. So literally, like even after the house is paid off, a third of the rent is gonna go toward taxes. If we rent it, yeah, it's hard to pencil that out for good cash flow. And don't forget the extra transaction costs of the good old New York State mortgage oh, tax. Oh, we know all about that. Oh yeah, every yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of all all the extra thousand dollar charges for New York State and all that stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. funny. We're uh, we're relocating south. That's we're gonna we're we're Florida bound here within three years when our when our 15 year old gets out of high school. So. I'll be very nice to be in some place a little, a little more business friendly. I'm, I'm a native Texan, so I, I don't there like There you it. go. Get <laughs> yeah. back to your roots. So but, so let me let me quickly answer then my perspective on, uh, from your please. question. And I'll, I'll talk specifically real estate investing market um, you know, perspective from my, from my standpoint. Um, I think, unfortunately, in the economy, um, so I guess I'll start high level. In the economy, I think you're unfortunately seeing a big separation in the wealth gap, right? And I bring that up, um, you know, you look at unemployment of people with salaries under $40,000 and so on and so forth. I think that that gap is unfortunately growing from like the already really rich to getting richer and the, the lower middle class is sort of staying there. And so there's going to be that, that gap. I think honestly, from a real estate investor perspective, you're going to see the same thing um, is that the, the people that are actively investing and executing are going to continue to have a lot of opportunities to grow. Um, and it's going to be harder to get your get off the ground um, and grow like a, a business like you guys have. Um, I just think just the landscape of whether it's the acquisition world, the lending world, the the reposition itself, and then the disposition, it's it's going to be harder to execute. And we've seen a lot of people that have been successful because of home appreciation, so on and so forth. So um, I think that from a high level, from an investing perspective, from the real estate itself. I think you give it six months from now is when, you, you know, if you want to sell anything, you want to liquidate, you want capital, you better get selling now because there's been so much pent up demand. Pricing is actually going up. Activity is actually higher than we were in most scenarios of listings and showings than we were last year at the same exact point in time in this, in this new now sort of summer season. So sell now if you need to sell. You can still flip and make a lot of money over the, over the, over the future, but values aren't going to continue to appreciate at the rate that they have. But at the same time, why that will be dropped down is that there will be a lot more distressed product. Your foreclosure auction deals are going to come back once the for, forbearances and for, the foreclosures are lifted and open and the forbearances wind out. Unemployment stays high. It just is good, an, a, a, it's a recipe for distress, unfortunately, mm -hmm. which will pose yeah. a lot of uh, acquisition opportunities. So there is a good wave of acquisitions coming, unfortunate uh, of how it will be coming. Uh, right. But I'm confident in that. But at the same time, you have to back to what we started with the standpoint of you got to have a business plan. You've got to be able to execute on it, hold yourself accountable to it, uh, because it is going to be a little bit harder to navigate through that in, in these upcoming times. But the six month plus time frame is when I think you'll see the additional supply come to market and the demand supply demand fundamentals shift a little bit. Yeah, we've been saying that. I don't think you know, I don't think we've seen even the first part of the crunch yet. I don't think we've seen it. I think we're all. Anybody who's been around for that at the time, we like we built our business and we started in 2008. Where our first, we bought our first house in 07, 08, and we had the first two loans were, um, uh, what do you call them? Stated income. Pretty much free money. Whatever. Not, yeah. not free money, but stated income. Stated you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, whatever it was. So no it was like, hey, I'm good. I made a billion last year, whatever. So it was stated income loans. And so all of a sudden those got ripped away from us and we had to punt and figure out how to raise capital. We haven't done nearly at the, the level you guys have done. We raised five million just for our own houses we're doing, awesome. that kind of stuff. But we figured out how to do that. But we we lived through that market and seeing that. And now I'm seeing the I'm I'm sitting in the spot saying, huh, what do we want to do with the next 10 years of our life? Because this has been 10, 13 years, I guess we've been doing it and we've been doing lots of stuff. Now we're saying, what is the opportunity? I think, like, just like you said, people are looking, saying, "How much? How much do I? How much of a bite do I want to take? 
right? There's a there's good, and I don't. It's it hasn't hit us yet. But the pan, yeah, the pandemic I think is going to have a massive trickle effect. Like it's not sure. just all going to slam in at once. No, you know, it's going to. Agree. We'll see the foreclosures look, come back and all that. Let's make this point clear, though. It doesn't matter where the market is. There will always be money to be made in real estate. Like it doesn't always. matter. You you, you talk the peak of the market, you can make money. You can talk the 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 valley of the market, you can still make Absolutely. money. It's just about good right. business plan and execution. Right. I mean that, that's 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 what I got from this today. Really, is that it's it's you've got to have a business plan and you have to execute. And if you want to have a bigger business like you guys have, it's just a bigger plan and more execution and and continuing to execute. So I'm sure that. Don and you, you got anybody that has any vested interest in those businesses, you're taking a bigger step and more, you know, you're taking steps that are bigger and more um, risk filled than other people are. And that's why you're farther ahead. But you're taking that you're taking the steps required, even though you come to Roblox and say, oh, this is going to be a big step. We're going to do this or, hey, we're going to go from 15 employees to 30. Those are big steps. I'm going to, I'm going to add five more. That's a big step. But I, right? I think it's also important to know what you want to accomplish. And yes, the business plan is a good idea, but you don't have to have it all figured out but, because you're going to make, you're going to make tweaks yep. as you're going along. Right. You're going to make adjustments. Your, you know, your goals might change or evolve over time. So I think you still have to have some sort of flexibility even within that business. plan. So that's a great question. And I know we're getting run out of time, but I wanted to ask you this. So did you, you know, was, before you met Don or when you came on, did Don say, yes, yeah, so we're going to have 10,000 doors in 10 years. And we're going to do, you know, did, was that the vision then? I'm just curious. So, um, <laughs> so I've, I've been fortunate. I've been with DLP for three years. So I haven't, I wish I knew Don 10 years ago because who knows what I'd be doing now, but you probably heard stories. Yeah. I, I can tell you this, man. Um, like I've, Don is always raising the bar more than everybody else. And like, that goes to prove your point. Did he maybe predict 10,000 doors? No, but I know at the point in time where he started multifamily, it wasn't, oh, I'm just going to do this 10 unit, 20 unit deal. It was right. like, we're going to grow. It's going to be four digit number. It's going to be a thousand at the least. And then it was like, wait a minute, we're at a thousand. Okay, 10,000. So like we, the importance right. of goals in setting a plan is extremely important to your point. Amber, you, you have to be able to adjust. I mean, like no one really planned for COVID. Right. right. I mean, like, no. Yeah. But, who right. But yeah. we still have our one year goal that we set out for in January. We still have our three and five year goals that we set out for in the beginning of the year, too. We're still going to go after that. Maybe we tweak this year's goal. We have tweaked it down in some regards and some of the sure. businesses a little bit. Um, but the important thing is we still have a plan. We still have a goal. Um, and so, you know, back to your original question, Glenn, I will say that I wouldn't be that surprised if Don did exactly plan for something like this, because. Uh, every time it's like, man, like we're doing awesome. And then in, this is our goal for this year. Next year, it's like, man, all right, I guess we got to start over again and keep going. So, well, that's it. But, but the, to Amber's point, though, is that when people, our listeners are saying to themselves, because listen, 10,000 doors sounds overwhelming, but we even know that if we put our mind to it and said, let's do that, that it wouldn't happen tomorrow. I'm not going to go out and buy a 10,000 unit building tomorrow. That's not in the wheel. That's not the way, that's yep. not the way reaching your goals, at least for most people. That's the way most, it's a process. And you have to set the goal. You set it. Make the plan. Execute. Now you get, if you know, you guys are like us. It's like you start getting close to the goal and go, maybe we should move the bar a little bit. So that's not a bad thing, right? But you've got to get to that goal and you reach it. And then you look back one day and say, huh, I wasn't really thinking about doing that, but here we are today. So I think it's it's a, it's a step. It's a stepping process you have to do. And there's that saying that you say, what you can accomplish in um, ten years is a lot more than you. Think, what, 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 yeah, you know yeah we learned at Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins said, you know, what you people drastically overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, but they dramatically underestimate what they can accomplish in five or ten. Right. Love it. So you guys are the living proof of that. You you embody that statement because if you know some people say I'm gonna own, I'm gonna do twelve flips in my first year. Now we all know that's hard as hell. It I mean, is. We, we did we, new, we yeah. did one, then three, then seven then 12 then 20 and that was a that was a bad year but <laughs> so you know we grew too fast but but i think you learn as you go i think the whole point of this though is that you make that plan you execute and then when you get close to the goal or you hit the goal you relook at it and say okay what's the next one and then you look back one day and say huh and i think you know as much as we flip houses my my preferred thing is to hang on to rent hang on to building that wealth that's what we're that's what we do and that's what we, we we build that wealth we build that we have Airbnbs we mess around with now. We got we got a handful of those, and so you know we're 
we're doing things to build cash flow and build wealth and because flipping's fine i drive past the house and go okay we flip that house big deal when you drive past one you own and i imagine you guys you, if you drive past the house you know a multi-unit and go hey this is a 200 unit we own that that has for me that would be a tremendous amount of pride you know i drive yeah. something about driving past a house that you own we we drive past four or five on the way home every day they're nice they're really nice they're not junkies they're nice homes and we rent them out and I drive past and no one knows who I am and the tenants don't know who I am. I don't do the management. I, you know, I like that feature. You know what this interview made me think of though? That it's okay to dream big. And it I think is. so many people, you know, stifle their own dreams or they might have family members that tell them that's unattainable or you're, you know, you have such pie in the sky visions or whatever, but it really is, you know, if you can get all that like noise out of your head, you know, it's okay to dream big and go for your dreams. And you I gotta think, be around I think we other circle it. like you. I think you circle all this back to the beginning is like you have to have passion and purpose and that bled into what our culture is, but you have to know why you're doing it. Right. And why that those houses feel so good when you drive by it. Sure. Like seeing a pretty house is great, but like you had a plan, you executed on it and there it is sitting there staring at it. And you're, that was part of your passion and your, and your purpose at that point in time and probably now still. And so sure. and that's I, where I think if you keep that at it, you know, because look, Someone once, someone told me yesterday, I hadn't heard, is like, some people just want to dig ditches. Like, that's fine. Right. You got to know what, what that plan is and then, you know, go about doing it because of your passion and your purpose. We uh, we always like to end every every interview. We talk, you know, our the title of our show is a real estate of mind show. And so it's sort of a play on the New York, you know, Billy Billy Joel song and all that. But we we believe very strongly that if you don't have your head right, You'll never reach your goals. You know, if you had the best plan in the world, but if your head is full of trash and stinking thinking and whatever you want to call it, you're never going to accomplish that. So how do you, and even in your culture, how do you keep yourself mentally strong? You've got you've got a million things coming to you every day, I can just tell. And you and, and listen, they're not all great. Not all phone calls are wonderful. We know that, right? <laughs> so you've got to maintain some level of um positive, not not pie in the sky Pollyanna ship, but you got to maintain a, a emotional health. Yeah, emotionally yeah. Stay, stay, stay above it all. How do you keep strong mentally and keep your, your mind strong? It's it's a great question. Sometimes I feel like I wish I knew the answer to it. We, we're the same way, man. I get it. I know. So I will say though that, and it's not to be repetitive, but to me, it's it's my passion and purpose. And I related to, you know, I went through two years of like a lot of Tony Robbins and I need to go back to him because I do love it. But like, to, like one of the things was always like, what's your inner question? And so I've found that inner question and I define it two ways. It's one for something that's like tangible or a process. It's how can I make it better? Like, so my, what drives me when I get up in the morning is how can I make it better? How can I make this better, that better? How can we do more loans? How can we, you know, make more profit? How can I make it better? And then when it comes to people, it's how can I provide an impact? And that's what just drives me. And I know that I'm always going to drive to make something better or provide an impact to people. And that just continues to push me. And that's my passion and my purpose. And hence the, you know, what's my internal question? That's what it is. And that's why I like to think that I can stay sharp is because I'm doing it for a bigger, bigger picture that I'm in tune with, that, yeah. I, that I am very, very satisfied with knowing that as long as I can better certain things and impact people, I will continue to push as hard as I can to be mentally acute, to be mentally stronger and to execute. Be the best version of yourself. We're big Tony Robbins fans yeah. too. Been to, you know, we've been to the business mastery and all that stuff. And it's, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty great stuff. And, we get it. And I think too, that a lot of people, we're just not innately born with the tools we have in our internal toolboxes to handle all the outside stresses. And that's when people can, you know, mentally not, crack not, yeah I'm into <laughs> crack. and so you know there's there's things that people can do whether it's going to events like anthony robbins or reading books or exercising daily or eating healthy or listening to positive podcasts or you know like really immersing yourself in the tools that you need to uh, to be able to stay mentally strong i think being around people you know as we do our interviews and we meet people and we're in mastermind and whatnot and so even even talking to you today yeah. so so i so here's the funny part. You want to have a good laugh? You guys start telling your story, what you're doing. Here's what I wrote on my sheet. It says, it says, are we slackers? Question mark. WTF. That's what I wrote on there. I said, I said, Jesus. He, he showed that to me. I mean, you know, mid interview here. I mean, I'm like, I, I think we're doing okay. Yeah, I'm not, I think we are. I mean, may, may I got to rethink my goals, you know? So, but being around people, you know, I'm just sharing. I just, being yeah. around people that, that are. Thinking bigger, thinking differently. Iron sharpens iron. You yeah. Know, when, when we join that mastermind, just being around 
you know, like we're, we're a big fish in a small pond here, but you go and, and get around people that are doing, have bigger businesses than you are. It oh, opens yeah. your eyes about, hmm, I, you know. Yeah, you start you're, telling you're, me, well, I'm number eight in the country. I'm thinking, yeah. hell, I'm number eight in my backyard. I don't know. If I'm, I, I don't know. You know what I mean? But so what? You know, there's a million people here. There's 300 million people. So it's just funny. I just, I, I guess I want to wrap by saying, I appreciate you being here today. And it's, it's, um, it's been eye opening. It's been great. And it, you know, it challenges us to think differently. I hope yeah. the listeners are feeling the same way, at least. And I want to make sure they understand that it's a process. It's a process. It's tangible and you can get there, but it takes years. It doesn't yeah. take, it doesn't happen in a day. And that you I, can find great people for your team by just being on Indeed. <laughs> hard, I mean, it, but you can do oh, it. Very hard. Yeah. But, but it's very possible. So, Nathan, before we wrap up, just tell everybody one more time how they can reach you, how you can help, yes. and all that kind of good stuff with lending and all that stuff. Yeah, so lending specifically, directlendingpartners.com. Email us at info at directlendingpartners.com. And then um, I talk loudly, so my podcast is called Talking Loudly with Nate, and you can see that at talkingloudly.com. Awesome. Awesome. Nathan, thanks so much for being here today, man. I really appreciate it. Great interview. Loved it today. And now I have to get back to work. Damn it all. Today. <laughs> Nathan, <laughs> I gotta crack the whip. Jeez, Thank you. You're an overachiever. You're an overachiever. Now you just push me. Damn it all. All right. Nathan, thanks again, <laughs> thanks, buddy. Nate. Thank Everybody, you, see you on the next one. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review. And leave us your questions and comments, and we will personally answer. And please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.